Okay. Hello, students. Today we're going to do the synapse, which really is chapter two in our Vitamin book. Okay. Some of you have had it, some of you may not, but we'll do it for everybody else who didn't have it. But before we can talk about the synapse, let's draw the synapse. And again, I know you've seen this a thousand times. But this is the basis. And we should be educating our patients on this, just like when we were in detox, we educated the woman. We were doing the sewer protocol, having her shake out her, stick out her hands, and her. Sh I told her that if the shakes can be caused by too much adrenaline, and when you take away the alcohol, which is sedative, you're going to have an overload of adrenaline and dopamine, causing shakes and sweats and things like that. Okay. So there's many, many neurotransmitters. So this is the presynaptic nerve. Let's label some things here. Presynaptic nerve, synapse, or I should say synaptic cleft. space, right? This is postsynaptic nerve. Okay, good. So electricity comes down this nerve pathway. E negative means electricity in physics and chemistry. And when the electricity gets to the end of a nerve, the end of the axon terminal, it's called, it has to find a way to talk to the next nerve. Okay, of course, this space is microscopic. You can never see that space. What evolution has done is created this nerve creates neurotransmitters that sit at the end of this nerve and wait for the electrical impulse. Okay, the electrical impulse comes down and it releases neurotransmitters. Well, first we're going to do the excitatory ones. Okay, the excitatory neurotransmitters is more appropriately, I know I, I tend to say adrenaline, but really it's noradrenaline, also known as norepinephrine. I say adrenaline because everybody gets it. They understand what that means. So norepi, I'll just say norepi. Okay. Another excitatory one is dopamine. Okay. Well, norepi or epi, epinephrine, how does it make you feel? Hyper. Excited. And we can think about caffeine. When you drink caffeine, you're indirectly elevating these neurotransmitters. Okay? And if you drink a lot of caffeine, even a little caffeine, you would shake. You would shake a little bit. What makes you hyper? We also know that dopamine is the central pleasure neurotransmitter. Meaning all drugs elevate dopamine to a certain amount. We also know that dopamine helps coordinate movement. Coordinate muscle movement. We also know not enough of it causes an illness called Parkinson. Okay? Those people with Parkinson's, they can move, but it's not smooth. It's what's called cogwheeling, because it looks like a dirty machine, okay? We also know, we'll go over here, we also know that too much dopamine, and this is theoretical, causes paranoid psychosis. I should say paranoid and psychosis. There is no doubt that it is more complicated than this, but this is the basic biology. And if you know this, you could read a medical book and understand half of it. Pretty cool. Okay, another neurotransmitter that can be released. Immediate receptor is called serotonin. We know that serotonin helps regulate mood and anxiety. Not enough of it. We'll go a little arrow down. You you may be depressed. Uh, depressed and or anxious. Okay. Let's go back for a second. These two are excitatory, meaning when they hit that receptor, they turn that nerve on and all the nerves down that nerve pathway. Serotonin, I like to think, goes both ways because it'll get rid of depression, it'll elevate your mood and reduce your anxiety. Really what makes a neurotransmitter excitatory inhibitory or inhibitory is the receptor it hits. I believe there's like seven different types of dopamine receptors. 
five or six serotonin type subtype receptors. That's what does it. But this is the basic thing. Okay, another neurotransmitter that can be released is called gamma amino butyric acid. We'll just call it GABA. One of my students said the way you remember that is GABA break. GABA break. That's the break of your brain. That's the gas pedal of your brain. You had a car and you had your foot fully down on the on the gas pedal with no brake, you're in trouble. And that is someone coming off of, of, of alcohol or benzodiazepines or morphine. We'll get to that in a minute. So GABA helps regulate anxiety and seizures. The seizure is too much electrical connection going on in the brain. The brain is excited. What drug might cause a seizure? Type of a stimulant. Alcohol. That would help them to decrease it. In withdrawal, you're right. Cocaine. Cocaine. So under the influence, cocaine elevates these neurotransmitters. But in withdrawal, you're correct. <laughs> the withdrawal from alcohol is similar to the, the influence of cocaine, except you got there from a different direction. Basically, when you're in over, when you're withdrawal from alcohol, too much excitatory neurotransmitters. When you're under the influence of a stimulant, cocaine, too much excitatory neurotransmitters. Okay. Well, there's another another thing, another neurotransmitter. Well, endorphins, endorphine. Endo means from within. Fine means comes from morphine. This really was two words that somebody made it for one. Endorphine, morphine from within our brain. Excitatory, excitatory goes both ways, inhibitory, inhibitory. Under normal conditions, your body has to regulate these levels. What controls regulation? Genetics, current environment, and childhood experience. Oh, if I was, if a German Shepherd's chasing me, that's current environment, I'm going to release massive amounts of adrenaline. I'm going to try to get away from it. Okay, if I was bitten by a dog when I was a kid, I might release more. Because my brain learned dogs bite, dogs bite, dogs bite, dogs hurt, dogs bite. I must get away from here, release a lot of adrenaline, no getting it out of here. Again, energy, and you don't want to trip running away, so you're coordinated. Okay. And that's really where therapy, talking to someone in therapy helps that. They can work through those issues by understanding them better, right? And there's this, basically there's two types of therapy. So there's many, many subtypes. Freudian, which is analytic, psychodynamic, lay on the couch, free associate. Or cognitive behavioral, let's change your thought patterns. Your automatic thought is you're afraid of that German Shepherd. Okay, but, he, but the dog's not growling. He's walking down the street. He's on that side of the street. So it, it, you have to say, okay, I'm safe right now. People have to relearn that. Cognitive behavioral therapy. So these neurotransmitters get released depending upon what the environment is telling you to do. And nature and God, and I consider nature and God one and the same, in my personal view of the world. They put a little recycling pump here. So when they're no longer needed here, they get reabsorbed into this nerve to be stored again to await another electrical impulse. It's interesting that man has only begun recycling like 20 years ago. Right? Nature figured it out a million years ago. If we copy nature, we'll probably be better off. All right, let's look at some common mental disorders. And like I've said to all of you, all of us are on the continuum for all these disorders. The question would be, how much environmental stimulus would it take for us to get that disorder? Let's look at anxiety. Anxiety could be too much adrenaline, maybe too much dopamine, maybe not enough serotonin, maybe not enough GABA, or maybe not enough endorphin. Well, what can we do for someone with anxiety? thing we can do is give them a medicine that'll, that will block their adrenaline from getting to that receptor. You might remember from a few weeks ago, that is called propranolol. 
and no lull. Good enough. It will go to that receptor. The adrenaline can't get to it. You'll be calmer. In fact, this is an old, still used though, high blood pressure medicine, antihypertensive. What do you think the side effect of propranolol could be? Go to the bathroom a lot. Go to the bathroom a lot. Um, dry mouth. Probably opposite, because that will make you have dry mouth. Fatigue. We need some adrenaline to be alert. Think of coffee. When we block the caffeine, we block that. So the side effect of this, that's why it's not used much anymore for high blood pressure. Some people can be on it fine, but many people found, yeah, my blood pressure is low and my energy level is low too, and I don't want that. So now there's all kinds of different antihypertensives. They've refined this to create other, this is called a beta blocker. It blocks the beta adrenaline receptor, adrenergic receptor. So now there's metoprolol, labetalol, there's a whole bunch of them, okay? And actually, different psychiatrists can use different medicines for anxiety. This will get rid of physical anxiety, but it will not get rid of worry. Are most of the meds used for that are blood pressure meds? No. You, can use a, you can use a beta blocker to help somebody with the physical symptoms of anxiety, shaking, sweating, things like that. When I went to did my graduate work at Stony Brook, I was in the counseling center, and students would come in that were how to play the guitar for their PhD, and they were so nervous they were hitting the wrong strings. The psychiatrist ordered a low dose of propranolol, blocks their adrenaline, and their fingers were calm. There was no shake. We assessed that woman for mm -hmm. shakes. That's adrenaline we're looking at. We could give her propranolol and get rid of that. The problem would be propranolol does not protect against seizures. That's the all right. Well, maybe we could find another way to decrease somebody's uh, uh, anxiety. We could block their dopamine receptor. And those are called antipsychotic. A better name for them would be major tranquilizers. And I say that because it's good enough for me. Because when you tell a patient who has anxiety that you're going to give them an antipsychotic, what do you think their response is? No way. I'm not taking that. I'm not crazy. Mm -hmm. Just because a medicine is approved by the FDA, for one thing, doesn't mean it can't be used for something else. But the patients here are antipsychotic, and they say, no way, I'm not taking that. As nurses, we have to educate the patient to make them want to take it, right? Mental disorders shorten people's lives, physical disorders. When we give the medicines that correct their neurotransmitter imbalances, we literally extend their lives. The average life expectancy for a drug addict is 40 years old. And I, I bet that's even gone down with the heroin epidemic. It's probably 35 years old. Because this is because your judgment is off and you're gonna fall asleep and not breathe. Okay, all right. Well, they did find out that if you raise somebody's serotonin, you'll also reduce their anxiety. So how do we do that? Well, there's a class of drugs that goes to this recycling pump called SSRIs. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And what they noticed, they were giving it to people that were depressed and not only did their mood elevate, but their anxiety went down. So they said, aha, wow, that's pretty cool. Now we can give somebody medicine that'll get rid of the worry here, the shakes here, and it's not addictive. Major breakthrough, major. Because prior to that, you had to give, either give them this, this, or benzos that affect GABA. I'll write that down. Benzodiazepines effectively elevate GABA. as does alcohol. What's the problem with benzos? They're addictive. We don't want to make addicts out of people, right? So SSRIs are the best treatment for chronic anxiety. Intermittent anxiety once or twice a week, a little bit of a benzo you can take, get over that hump. But if you do benzos every day, some people, not everybody, could get addicted. <clears throat> 
psychiatrist or a doctor wants to try the SSRI, Zoloft, Prozac, Axel, Lexapro, Celexa, okay, he'll try the, one of those first. And if they don't work, then he has to decide, okay, do I want to go for an antipsychotic here? Do I want to try? Benzo is absolute last resort. Okay. Well, let's talk about depression. Well, depression we have found could be a, a not enough serotonin, maybe not enough norepinephrine or dopamine. So now the next question is how do we elevate those neurotransmitters? The old, you might remember, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, MAOIs, from the mood lecture. Let me just step back a second. In this synaptic cleft, I'm going to erase this so I have more room. In this synaptic cleft are enzymes that just float around. And an enzyme, one of those is called MAO. Monoamine oxidase. Whenever you hear ASE at the end of a word, that means that's on. Well, that MAO, these are amines right here. It breaks down those neurotransmitters into parts so they don't work on their receptor anymore. They're reabsorbed into the cell in pieces and reassembled. Well, if we inhibit that enzyme, MAOI, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, we inhibit it, okay, they can break down the chemicals. For neurotransmitters. In fact, the first, these are the first discovered antidepressants. They put people on the MAO, Nardil, things like that, for tuberculosis because they had antimicrobial properties. And they noticed, holy mackerel, not only is your TV going away, you're in a better mood. Let's try this on a depressed person. And it worked very well. But there's one problem. And you don't break down norepinephrine and dopamine, which way does your blood pressure go? You have what's called a hypertensive brain. These aren't used much anymore because the patients, if they eat, you're giving a depressed per person the ability to take themselves out. Don't eat any aged food because you, you might have a seizure or a stroke or a heart attack. Oh, hmm, right? Depressed people could be suicidal. So these are considered lack of better dirty medicines, a lot of side effects, okay? Um, and just so you know, I think I said this, Ammerman Campus was a, was a TB hospital back in the 30s and 40s. If you go to Kryling Hall, some of those old buildings, they housed patients with TB. The idea was get them out of the city where the air is clear, and on Long Island, because this was 50 or 60 years, 70 years ago, 80 years ago, where the air is clean, okay? But they realize they also elevate mood, but you can cause a hypertensive crisis. So if a patient is on this, we want to tell them, avoid aged foods, any aged foods, sauerkraut, beer, wine, in particular, Chianti wine, but I would just tell someone, avoid aged food. In reality, what's going to happen is the dietitian will come up and talk to them about what foods they can or can't eat, okay? MAOI prevents the breakdown, prevent the breakdown, what is the receptor, better move. A lot of side effects. Okay, then about the 60s, they came out with what was called tricyclic antidepressants. TCA is their called tricyclic antidepressants. They block the reuptake here of norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. So you're getting some mood elevation by, by blocking the reuptake of these. But what do you think norepinephrine or adrenaline and dopamine can do to your heart rate? jack it up. Or it can cause what's called cardiac conduction abnormalities. So these are lethal. Tricyclic antidepressants are lethal, or I should say potentially lethal, in overdose due to cardiac conduction abnormalities. Okay. So once again, we have a pretty good antidepressant, but the side effects are no good. And they cause a lot of anticholinergic side effects. Can't see, can't pee, can't spit. We'll let you fill in the rest of it. Okay. Causes constipation. If someone gets constipated, they're not going to take these meds. But let me ask you guys, as nurses, a doctor or a nurse practitioner puts someone on a tricyclic, what might you recommend for that patient to eat every day? 
Fiber. 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 Exactly. That's good nursing. Right? We might even want to say, you know, doctor, the first patient hasn't gone to the bathroom in four days. Would you like to add a stool saw? We'll certainly start out with fiber, uh, a lot of fluids, things like that. That's good. Nursing, the doctor prescribes something, and nurse says, how do I have the patient adhere to this? I'll tell you right now, they're getting constipated. They're not going to get No one likes constipation. So they block the reuptake, tricyclic antidepressants, block the reuptake of adrenaline, dopamine, and serotonin. Mood elevation, a lot of side effects. Okay. Well, again, back to SSRIs. The first one being Prozac, fluoxetine, Eli Lilly. It was a blockbuster med. It might even be the most prescribed med in history. Fantastic. Blocks reuptake of just serotonin, i.e. selective, because these are non-selective. Blocks the reuptake of just serotonin, more in the space, more with receptor. You're in a better mood, less anxious. Very few side effects. The one, there are a couple of side effects in your early treatment, a little nausea, possible vomiting, a little GI upset, that, they usually go away. There's a side effect that might not go away, and that's the sexual side effect. Okay. Well, that sexual side effect, let me step back. All these neurotransmitters are in a, what I have read called an exquisite balance. Oh, when we jack this one up, but these stay where they are, we disturb that balance. And that's what causes the sexual side effect. So if we could raise these up a little bit, we could get rid of that sexual side effect. Well, there's another medicine called, I'm going to erase this to more room, called bupropion, also known as Wellbutrin. Bupro Pion that blocks the reuptake of norepinephrine dopamine. What the clinician can do if someone says, well, I'm feeling good, doctor, nurse practitioner, I'm in a good mood, but I'm finding it difficult to have sex with my wife. Okay, we're going to add 75 milligrams of bupropion on the evening you would like to have sex. It jacks up these neurotransmitters. You can have your sex. Next day, if you don't have sex, don't take it. Okay. So again, all of this is micromanaging neurotransmitters. Yep. I thought uh, well you have to take for a long time for it to start. For the antidepressant effect, you're right. Not for the not for the um anti it's in that's immediate. Okay. Very good question. It increases it or it makes it just normal? Well, it trying? increases it to the to the new level of serotonin. Now remember this level's higher because you block the reuptake. You have too much of this compared to that, you have a decreased sex drive. So we've got to find a way to increase these to equal a new level of that. Okay? That's what can be done. This by itself is quite a good antidepressant. Very good antidepressant. Okay? Elevating the pleasure neurotransmitter and adrenaline. Okay? So we've done anxiety. We've Oh, let's talk about bipolar. So bipolar disorder is a considered to be a dysregulation of norepinephrine, adrenaline, norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. In the manic phase, when the person's hyper, okay, doesn't need sleep, they have lots of adrenaline, dopamine, and serotonin. And for some reason, those levels drop. You could think of it as, probably more complicated than this, but you could think of it as you're spending it all over a month or two or three, and then you run out. It's more complicated than that, but that's basically what's happening. Is you're feeling really, really, really great, too great, and then they go away. They can't be replaced that quickly, and you go into a depressive despair. And then you're there for months and months and months and months, and for some reason, you come back up. Okay, so the question now is how can we stabilize the, the level of norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin? Well, we have to find a way to decrease their release, right? That would be the trick here. So decrease, because remember, this nerve down the pipe is releasing these neurotransmitters. So if we can get somehow to cause this nerve to calm down, it won't release its neurotransmitters. Well, one way would be to elevate GABA. Because GABA 
is the break of the nervous system. Okay. Well, we can give somebody a benzo. Clonazepam, clonopin, can be used for mood control. Another medicine, the gold standard, is lithium. What lithium does, and again, this is theoretical, because it's very hard to study the brain. The theory with lithium is that you have sodium receptors on these nerves that co causes the action potential. I think sodium goes in and potassium comes out. I forget which way it goes. Well, lithium competes, lithium allies with lithium, competes for that receptor. And it jams it up. So it makes this nerve less reactive and that nerve less reactive. When the nerves are less reactive, they don't release their norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin, and the person's calmer and doesn't run out of neurotransmitters. Okay. The problem with lithium is what? The toxic range is right next to the therapeutic range. That's what's called a narrow therapeutic index. There's another medicine you guys are going to learn about, if not already, that has a very narrow therapeutic index. It's a cardiac med. Does anybody know what it is? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's also, you're right about that, that is true. That's a more blood clotting. Mm -hmm. Digitalis, digoxin. Oh, yeah. Stabilizes and steadies the heartbeat, mm -hmm. except the toxic range is right next to the therapeutic range. So as nurses, before we give a digoxin pill to a patient, what do we do? We listen to their heart rate, not even their pulse. We don't even trust that. We take our stethoscope and physically listen to their heart rate. If it's too low, then you can get it. And that number is 60 beats per minute. If it's less than 60 beats per minute, you can hold that medicine. You don't even have to call a doctor. because That is just standard operating procedure. Of course, next time we see, we probably tell them, and probably lower the dose, right? But we don't have to call, we can just hold it. We want to probably hear our head nurse mm -hmm. before we use it there, okay? Okay. So, in fact, lithium stabilizes that. Lithium, again, a great medicine, but has a lot of side effects. Shakes, tremors, nausea, vomiting. In high doses, long-term, possible kidney damage or thyroid damage. Now, they have found ways, I think, by using a minimal amount of lithium, one, per, one dose per day, once a day dosing, to decrease those problems. I've seen patients who have to be on dialysis because they were on lithium in the old days, in the 50s and 60s, they were on massive doses for many, 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 many years. So somewhere probably around the early 80s, I was a new nurse, I think I told you the story, I saw patients that were bipolar being put on anti-seizure medicines. I'm like, this is weird. Why would you put a bipolar patient on anti-seizure medicine? So I looked it up in my book, and many of these anti-seizure medicines elevate up. Elevate up, it turns it off, doesn't release the neurotrophy. For neurotransmitters, the person comes down, doesn't run out of it. Okay? So virtually, I won't say every, but many, many anti-seizure medicines, anti-epileptic medicines, can be used for mood stabilization. Topamax, valproic acid, Tegretol, there's a whole bunch of them. A whole, whole bunch of them. Up. And again, the doctor usually picks the one with the least side effects. Okay? So... That's the way we deal with, with bipolar disorder, is we want to decrease the release of these so the patient doesn't run out. All right? Well, let's talk about psychosis and schizophrenia. It's pretty much determined that too much dopamine causes psychosis and paranoia. So we said, how can we lower their dopamine? Ah, let's get a medicine that binds to the receptor, and we call them antipsychotic. Not that they can't be used for sleep, or anxiety. In fact, it is the, the, the antipsychotics, major tranquilizers, are the drug of choice for someone with a drug addiction. You don't want to give them a benzo. They're addicted. So they use antipsychotics, and they can work very well. And again, I think a better name would be major tranquilizers. Because again, if you tell someone who's anxious you're having an they say, no way. Okay? All right. So well, the problem with that, if you remember now, if you knock down somebody's dopamine, you induce what we call pseudo-Parkinsonism. Pseudo-Parkinsonism falls under the category of EPS, extrapyramidal symptoms. Aches, tremors, things like that. Okay. Well, now we got to say, remember all the balance I talked about? They're all always in a balance. When the balance of dopamine, I should add another one here. Only because I'm going to talk about it now. Acetylcholine.
acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter at the neuromuscular junction. This is produced in the brain. So they have to have a delicate balance, an exquisite balance for you to move smoothly. When you knock this down, and this is still high compar comparatively, you have EPS symptoms. But we have to give what's called an anticholinergic, anti-acetylcholine medicine to knock that down. And the drug of choice is cogentin, benzotropine. You could also use Benadryl. Benadryl is anticholinergic. Can't see, can't pee, right? That's anticholinergic. So it causes constipation too much better. Go ahead. Can't see a difference. Cogentin? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I, don't I was given that like I had Parkinson's symptoms from having uh -huh. I forget which medication I was on, unsterical. Um, and they gave me like a pill to help with the shaking, but they only gave me like a three day supply. So when I asked for like a like a, week, a month supply, they thought I was like abusing it, and they made me do like a drug test. Extension five, You know something? Extension five. People that abuse drugs will try to abuse anything, <laughs> everything. Right, so the doctor, if you're running out of your supply, he's going, oh, wait a minute, this is, that shouldn't happen. So he might just be saying, I'm not gonna continue to fill this because maybe you're not doing it, maybe you're selling it, oh, right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I've never heard that, but I would not be surprised. So they're only giving me a three-day supply and I would have to go from the South Shore to the North Shore every three days just to get a prescription. And what you could do is, so is, is take Benadryl. Yeah. Now, of course, you wanna tell your doctor that because he should tell what to take. Right. And I also think in my mood lecture that I recorded last week or so, we always want to ask the patient, are you taking any herbs or supplements? Oh, because they think it's natural enough to tell, tell the clinician. Well, St. John's Ward is a great antidepressant. You mix that with Prozac and you could have serotonin syndrome. Too much serotonin. So if you're on birth control and you take St. John's Ward, like... Uh, Probably what happens there is St. John's war induces the liver to metabolize the birth control pills more readily and they're not as effective. Yeah. In fact, anybody who smokes cigarettes probably has to take a higher dose of medicine, including birth control pills. If you've gone for surgery, the anesthesiologist comes in the night before and asks you a series of questions. And one of those questions is, do you smoke cigarettes? You say yes. And he says, how many packs? And you say two. Okay, we got to give this person more anesthesia tomorrow because nicotine, cigarettes, makes your liver go into overdrive and it metabolizes every other drug in your body more quickly. Right? Okay. So we've talked about anxiety, depression, bipolar. Uh, I want to go back to lithium for a second because when people take lithium, they should keep their salt intake and output, output steady. Say you're on lithium and you decide you're going to start jogging. You jog, you sweat out sodium, right? Well, now, comparatively, the lithium is going to be higher because you're, you're sweating out sodium. Or you decide, I'm going to eat a, a salty bag of potato chips every day. <laughs> well, now you put more sodium in your body, so your lithium level effectively goes down. Huh, that's why. Eat too many times. <laughs> <laughs> You want to, whatever amount of sodium you're getting in your body when you're getting stabilized on lithium, you should try to maintain that. Because lithium is a salt. That's right, exactly. So a great nursing question might be something like this. A patient has been stabilized on lithium in the hospital. They are discharged at home. They decide that they want to start jogging. What of the following interventions would be most appropriate at this time? Tell the patient to not jog. Tell the patient to ride a bicycle instead or tell the patient to see their doctor as soon as they start jogging to get a blood level of lithium and sodium, right? That would be the appropriate choice there. Right? The, the patient can't guess what their level is. You have to get a blood level. What's the blood level for lithium? 0 0.8 mm -hmm. to 1.2, 0 0.5 to 1.5. I'd say somewhere around one. The choice you should pick on a test is whatever number is closest to one. Is there ever a time that where they won't like increase your lithium? Because like I was at a point three and he didn't do anything about it. If you are stable, okay. then they keep it at the lowest at the dose lowest possible, dose. and that would be ideal. Right. Because you're, you're getting a response at such a low dose that your side effects is going to be less. Okay. On the other hand, if someone you can jack up their lithium to the higher level, one point four, one point five, getting closer to toxic range. But if you have stabilization. 
you say, okay, they're not toxic, they're close, but they're good. Let's keep them right there. What we learn here is psychiatry is more of an art than a science, right. or just as much an art. What do I think I can do here? All right, let's let's go to let's go to drugs now. Let me erase some of this. You guys going to the ladies' room? Yes. Okay. Let's get rid of some of this here. Uh, that will keep that. We'll get rid of this. So let's talk about drugs. Well, let's start out at with alcohol. Alcohol very common. Okay. What does alcohol do? Well, alcohol sedating, right? Um, but what neurotransmitter do you think it elevates? Exactly. Very good. Very good. <laughs> it elevates like like benzos. Exactly. When you get habituated to alcohol, in your body reacts by either producing less GABA, possibly producing more norepinephrine and dopamine to counteract it. Okay, and then you decide to stop drinking alcohol. Remember, when you were drinking it a lot, your body produced less of this. Now, when you stop drinking the alcohol, you don't have enough of this to cover you. And then you end up with shakes, sweats, high blood pressure, possible seizures, because you have too much of that compared to that. Remember, an exquisite balance. Once you disturb that balance, and that balance came about through probably a million years of evolution. What does that mean? Survival of the fittest. When you're, when these are too high, you're in a manic phase and your judgment is off. Over thousands of years, people with poor judgment don't live long enough to pass their genes on. So are we kind of playing against like? But we're correcting an imbalance, right? When you have too much, that's the disorder. We're bringing it back to the way it should have been, right? All right? Because. It, it, when you do stimulants, you're putting yourself in a manic phase. And people that do stimulants can have poor judgment. If caffeine is somewhat of an exception, a mild stimulant. I'm talking cocaine, methamphetamine, things like that. Really powerful stimulants. I'm surprised though, because like I'm I'm giving amphetamine and I but I'm bipolar. So it's just there's a small window and of where and you're probably on a mood stabilizer too. So they counteract that with the mood stabilizer. Once again, the doctor says, I have to micromanage these neurotransmitters. Right. I'll add a little of this, a touch of that, a little bit of that, and we'll see how the patient goes. Oh, you're too anxious, leave it, right? So I'm not like, because like, that's a big thing for me as a patient. It's like, I don't want to be on 10 different pills. But like, I guess there is a reason for being on There's a reason. And, yeah. you know, like I, I tell the patients on the, on, on, on the rehab unit, these doctors know what they're doing. Guys want to trust the doctor on the street corner who's not really a doctor, he's just a drug dealer. You know, take these pills, they'll make you feel better. He didn't go to medical school. Literally, a doctor went to medical school four years for a bachelor's, four years of medical school, and then four years of residency, and then maybe in a fellowship. So they could potentially have gone to school for 16 years of their life. I would trust them over the street corner drug dealer. Right? Okay. But again, the doctor is is bringing these back into a balance. Right. Okay. I feel like he thinks that you know, even if I might be a little bit more manic, it might be it might benefit me more than being more. Depressed. Right. He has to decide. So, you know, like, a little extra energy might be a little better than not too much energy. Right. And, and it all goes, "How are you doing?" He probably says, "How are you doing? How are you feeling? How are you sleeping? How is your mood?" Yeah, I know, but <laughs> no, <laughs> no one asks me questions. Okay. All right. So. <laughs> We've done um, anxiety, depression, bipolar. We did psychosis, blocking dopamine. We've got to go back to alcohol. Right? Alcohol effectively elevates GABA. Alcohol, uh, oh, you're going to increase your norepinephrine and your dopamine. Oh, okay, very good. So alcohol effectively elevates GABA. When you take it away, the person's anxious and nervous. We replace their alcohol with a benzodiazepine and calm, we calm the person down. And slowly, as the brain gets back to normal, producing more GABA, we can take away the benzo. Okay? Well, let's talk about uh, cocaine. If you are addicted to benzos and you finally come off it, does your body um, 
naturally produce enough GABA, or does it have like a deficiency? From using so what GABA? happens is there when you if you abruptly stop benzo and alcohol, you can have a rebound anxiety, a rebound, but eventually over probably alcohol is probably five days, benzos might be a couple of weeks, your body goes back to its normal state. And if that normal state is good with no problems, great. It might not be. So the doctor says, okay, you've been off of alcohol for two or three months and you're very anxious. Let's find a way to elevate your serotonin. We could elevate up, but that's back to addiction benzo, right? Go to a serotonin. Okay. So let's talk about um, stimulants. And all stimulants do one of two things or both. They either cause a massive release of norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin, and or block the reuptake, which makes them stay in the space. So I want to take cocaine and make that the prototypical stimulant. All stimulants work very similar. Really, the difference is half-life, how long they last in your body. Well, people used to take cocaine and put it up your nose, powder up your nose, a little goes to your brain. But somebody figured out in about 1987-88, how powdered cocaine does not burn very well. Okay, it's a source of you know. If you look at it, and this is just a, an example here cocaine hydrochloride don't want to burn, doesn't want to burn. If you cleave that bond and break that bond and get rid of that, you have freed the cocaine from its base, i.e., the term. Crack cocaine is a type of free base. It makes it burnable. Okay. Well, why? Well, if you took someone's nose and spread it one cell layer thick, the surface area might be the size of this table. If you took someone's lungs, the surface area, from what I have read, could be the size of from a tennis court to a football field. Because your lung is just a sponge. And you could never see one cell layer, right? But if you could spread it out, one cell layer thick, you would have tremendous amount of surface area. That's why smoking a drug can get so much more of that drug into your body quickly and shoot it right to your brain. Crack and cocaine are the same molecule. It's how you get it into your body that does it. Well, what does it do? It goes to this nerve. I guess we'll use the color to make things interesting. Goes to this nerve and makes this nerve release norepinephrine, adrenaline, dopamine, serotonin. You've basically induced a manic phase. That's why people do stimulants. They like the manic phase. Well, we're not done yet. It also goes here and blocks the recycling pump. So now you have massive releases of norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin pounding on their receptors, floating around, pounding on it. And not get recycled, so eventually they get washed away. They just kind of dissipate out of the synapse space. They get washed away. So now you're out of norepinephrine and adrenaline, you're out of dopamine, you're out of serotonin. How do you think it feel? Horrible. Horrible. So now you're in a depressive phase. What's the quickest way out of that? Like Give me know. more crack cocaine. Give me more stimulant. Well, you're constantly depleting it, but for some reason, this receptor is activated under the influence. The dopamine receptor is still activated. And now you're paranoid psychotic. So you start out because you like the mania. So basically, you're inducing a drug, a drug induced bipolar disorder. You're addicted. You keep doing it, looking for that first high. You can't get it because this is like. Your credit card or your cash card. You go, ah, you get cash, you get cash, oh, this is great, like it's great, blah, blah, blah. and then you go, it doesn't work. You have no money in your bank account. You have no more transmitter stored here anymore, right? Because they've all been released. And, the, and it takes Stephen Dewey, the famous brain researcher, if I remember correctly, found it can take up to two years to rebuild those neurotransmitters to the point as if you never did crack cocaine. Those two years are miserable. And I would say people are addicted to crack. It doesn't mean you have to suffer brutally for two years. It means you've been, after two months of not doing cocaine and you're not and you're feeling miserable, you go to your doctor and say, Doc, 
I'm sober. I haven't done any cocaine in two months, but I'm just not feeling good inside. He's probably going to put you on a little SSRI of Nupropion. Just to perk you off the block, we got to take a little bit, make your mood a little brighter. And we know when people are in better moods, they're less apt to do drugs. Because all drug use is self-medication. Everybody does it. We do it in the morning with caffeine. So what's going on inside with crack and alcohol at the same time? Okay, well, someone who smokes a lot of crack, they get nervous, they get jumpy, they get jittery. Let me have a drink to calm me down. Oh, too much alcohol, too calm. Let's do some more cocaine. It's a vicious cycle of micromanaging neurotransmitters. They get too, too nervous, drink some alcohol. Get too sedated, do some more cocaine. Or an alcoholic that smokes crack. Yeah, they're, they're, just, they're just messing with their neurotransmitters. Right? One is effectively counteracting the other. Once you, the first time you do crack cocaine, it will be very, very hard to ever achieve that high again. You might have to wait many months. In fact, I heard stories. The, 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 the person who's doing crack goes to the drug dealer, does crack for the first time, loves it, loves it, loves it, does it for a week or two, goes back to the drug dealer, gets some more. This stuff is garbage. It's no good, this stuff. Goes back and says, I want the good stuff. Because it's the same stuff you had a month ago. But it doesn't work. Why? There are no neurotransmitters. You spend them quicker than you can make them. Once again, it's like using your cash card. You've got to have the, the, the check deposited in that account so you can keep withdrawing money. People still chase that high. And what they do, they go from a bipolar-induced problem to paranoid psychosis. In fact, upstairs one time, patient said, don't buy the paranoia when you do cocaine a lot. They used to think, some patients would think the police climbed a tree and were up on a tree taking their pictures. I said, now you're kind of, your brain is becoming a schizophrenic, paranoid schizophrenic, but of course it's drug induced, right? Okay. And they can actually use antipsychotics for people that are high in pain. They can probably use a benzo first to really calm that brain down. Okay. You get anxiety, depression, bipolar, psychosis. Did that? Drugs, alcohol, cocaine. Let's talk about um, heroin. Okay. Endorphine, morphine from within your brain. Endo means from within. Okay. Well, it just so happens that heroin or any opiate, morphine, heroin, drugs like Pylox, Percocet, anything with an opiate in it, has a similar molecular structure to that, which means it can fit in that receptor. Okay, well, you do an opiate long enough, and your brain says, I'm not going to produce as much endorphins because I'm getting that endorphin for free. Why would a, brain, a, a body, an animal, produce something it doesn't need? And then one day you say, I'm, being, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. So you stop doing heroin. And you're good for about six or eight hours. At about hour eight or so, you start to sweat, you start to shake. Hour 10 or 12, you start to have vomit, nausea, diarrhea. It will be the worst flu you ever had. You won't die. Okay. One way you could die, if you vomit a lot and have a lot of diarrhea, you can get what's called an electrolyte imbalance because your sodium and potassium are whacked out. Oh, well... In addition to dehydration, your salts are, are gone because your hydrochloric acid, chlorine, hydrochloric in your stomach, you're getting rid of that. Okay? And now, remember, you need salts for your nerves to work. You need salts for your heart to work. Well, with an electrolyte, so that's how someone can get pretty rare and withdraw from an opiate. Doesn't they give you dextrose? What's that? Dextrose? Oh, yeah. Well, they can give you an IV of sugar water, dextrose sugar water, to perk up, give something to your brain. Okay? Dextrose is, is a generic something we give many IVs in people. It just kind of keeps the blood sugar up a little bit. Okay. Okay. Where was I now? Oh, heroin. So what do we do? We have to find a way to replace their heroin with a drug, hopefully with a longer half-life. This is relatively short. You go into withdrawal six or eight hours down the road. So they have chosen methadone. Little sidebar, methadone was made by Bayer in Nazi Germany during World War II, because Hitler couldn't, soldiers have to have more. When you're shot, you're screaming in pain. 
and the, and the medic comes up, gives you a shot of morphine, goes to the next guy, gives him a shot, hope gets you off the battle. But Hitler couldn't get that, so he said, Bayer, produce some kind of an opiate that we can use in the field, and that was methadone. Methadone has a very long half-life. But we can give the person who's doing heroin methadone in the detox ward over three, five, ten days maybe, as their body begins to produce its own endorphins. And then we can slowly get rid of the methadone as their body produces its own endorphins. Okay? Well, another use of methadone, methadone can be used for pain control, can be used for heroin opiate withdrawal. Another use is methadone maintenance. Patient has come to detox six times in the last year for opiate addiction. The doctor says, look, whatever we were doing, whatever we're doing is not working. I'm going to offer you to go on to methadone a little bit each day, not enough to get you high, just enough to go to that receptor and keep you from craving the drug. Okay, that's called methadone maintenance. They, you have to go to a county-run clinic, Riverhead, Huntington, or Hopog, in this uh, county. And you get that dose, you gotta go there every single morning to get that dose. Well, if you can take that methadone and crush it, you can inject it and get hot. Or you can save your pills and take it by mouth and get hot. Okay? That's a problem. So about 20 years ago, they went to an old drug that was studied, I believe it was the 60s or 70s. That was called buprenorphine. Buprenorphine. Can't spell too well. Fiend as in morphine. This is a relatively weak opiate, partial opiate, weak opiate. Goes to that receptor, keeps you from craving the drug. Okay. And what they did very, very, very clever is they mixed that with naloxone. Naloxone. That's called suboxone. Why do they put naloxone? Naloxone is known as Narcan. It's the antidote for heroin overdose. Because if someone injects this, that goes to that receptor. It doesn't allow that to go to that receptor and they don't get hot. But naloxone, the Narcan, is not active by mouth. It's only active by this. So if you divert it from a pill to this, you've just wasted your money. If you take enough Suboxone, you can't orally. You can't get high on it. Usually we're not giving some of that. It is safer, it's relatively less lethal in overdose than a pure opiate. What the government said due to the heroin epidemic, they said if, if doctors or nurse practitioners take a course on suboxone administration, they can administer this, they, they can prescribe this in a private office. Methadone, you must go to a county clinic. So many doctors, I've taken this course, and now we're working with patients that are heroin addicts that want to be sober. And we give them not enough to get them high. And I want to make that clear. They're not getting high unless they're taking it. No, a they're taking it just enough to occupy that receptor. When that receptor is occupied, the endorphin receptors are occupied, you're not craving the drug. You're less apt to go rob somebody to get money for heroin. Okay? Let's go to marijuana. Well, prior to 1987, they didn't really know how marijuana worked. Hey, maybe it's GABAergic because it's calming. Maybe it's serotonergic because it's calming, puts you in a good mood. They didn't really know. Somewhere in the late 80s, early 90s, a doctor discovered a receptor that THC binds to. How did they do that, by the way? They put a touch of radioactivity on the THC molecule. <laughs> Put it in your bloodstream and see where it binds to with the PET scan machine. Okay? Crazy science, right? Crazy science. Well, they discover this receptor. That receptor is not there for people to smoke marijuana. <laughs> Next question. Why is it there? There must be a chemical in our body that is made to go there. Lo and behold, there is, and they are called endo from within, cannabinoids. Oh, I can't spell very well, can I? Cannabinoids. The next question is, what do they do? Well, there's some evidence now. They have anti-inflammatory properties. 
they have anti-seizure properties and may uh, prevent cell death, neuroprotective property. But they're still in the infancy of this. Marijuana has been very, very hard to study because the DEA classified it as a Schedule One drug, meaning it has zero medicinal value when it's hardly addictive. Well, states are saying, we don't care what you say. We're going to legalize it, tax it, and we're going to study it. In fact, there was a girl in New Jersey named Kate. She had what's called intractable seizures. They tried everything, Epicode, everything, nothing to get rid of the seizures. But mom heard about marijuana having an anti-seizure quality to it. This is about 10 years ago. You went to Colorado where it was legal, went to some people that were growing it, and they developed this called Katie strain that has a lot of anti-seizure properties. Recently, I don't know when it happened, but a year or so ago, it seems to be I see CBD oil being sold everywhere. I guess the federal government changed the laws or something? I don't, something happened where they made it legal to study. CBD, kind of been a diol, doesn't get you high, but it has common properties. They're using that for anti seed So, obviously, these do something in our brain, and we're just figuring out what it does. Is there any type of drug that, like, Decreases that or increases it? Well, marijuana increases it, <laughs> right? From external source, right? right? Um, uh, there are drugs that decrease it. I, there probably are, but I don't know them. A pharmacologist would probably know what that would be, right? Is the CBD addictive? I don't think so. It doesn't really get you high, but even if a drug is addictive, if it helps people, can then we would say, okay, we know you might get addicted, but this is the drug we have to treat your seizures. Mm -hmm. We that need it. Exactly. It's, it's risk-benefit ratio. All medications are based on the risk-benefit ratio. How much benefit do you get versus the risk of addiction or a side effect? Mm -hmm. And the decision should be when you get put on a med is the benefit outweighs the risk of side right. effects. Mm -hmm. You had a question or was that the question? No, I was just trying to okay. I don't know, process so, and you'll addiction let... and like I lost it. Like, not like kind of like needing it, not needing, not quite being addicted to it, but needing, needing it. the people with seizure disorders yeah. need anti seizure medicine. Without it, if you break it down, they're not going to live as long. Mm -hmm. And this is what science does: is it gives us longevity and quality of life. That's what all medicine does, right? They may need it because without it, they're going to have a seizure. Mm -hmm. People with anxiety I need. An SSRI because without it, they're going to be so anxious they can't work, right? So we accept some side effects for a great benefit. Okay. All right. Let's think about this. What? What? what how? We, what did we cover everything? Does it look like? I don't know. Anything? With, any questions here? I, I wish this came out bigger on the screen. This is quite small. I could have made it bigger, but we did our best. But anyway, that's basically chapter two of Edibek. You know, what you need to know in Vedebeck is, for, for schizophrenia chapter, antipsychotics. What are their side effects? What are you going to teach the patient? What are you going to observe for? For mood, you have to know lithium. What's the normal level? What are the side effects? What are acceptable side effects? Polyuria, polyadipsia, minor fatigue. What are, what are no good side effects? It goes all the way to coma and death. You go above 2.0, 3.0 blood level, and you're, you're going into a toxic range. So you need to know the medicines for bipolar, schizophrenia, and the addiction lecture. The addiction lecture really covers bipolar because cocaine causes bipolar, drug-induced in a sense, right? You don't really have it. It's induced it by messing with your brain chemicals. So, um, chapter two, addiction, mood, schizophrenia, I think that's it. Okay? Good? No questions? Almost at 59 minutes and 12 seconds. How about that?